to reboot. Uh, it uh, doesn't seem to like the, the projector here, so we're just going to try and reboot and see if uh, we have any luck there. But I, I figure I'll just get started since it, it takes a while for it to uh, shut down and restart. Um, this is the uh, extending IIS with .NET session um, for all, the, all of you to make sure you're in the right room. Um, thank you for coming out and welcome. Um, my name is Colin Bowern. I work with a company in, uh, in Canada called Official Community. We build websites for rock stars and uh, we use and live by IIS. It's certainly one of those key components of our infrastructure as I'm sure it is yours, which is why you're here today. How many people uh, have uh, played with IIS 7 uh, out there? Has anybody uh, downloaded the, the, IIS, the trials and played with it? Nope. Oh, a few, one, two, cool. Um, so IS7, uh, for those of you um, who didn't see the, the session this morning on the what's new, it's the uh, new version of IS that shipped with Windows Server 2008. It also shipped with uh, Windows Vista as well. Um, the versions that, the, the basic differences between the versions, the core is exactly the same. They've added on some extra modules for Windows Server 2008 that are more geared towards full-fledged uh, web serving and they're working on you know, basically uh, fulfill, or backporting those through the service pack process. So if you're on Vista today, you'll want to make sure that you get onto Vista service pack one to get all of the uh, stuff that they, they delivered in server 2008 onto your, your local uh, environment for development. Um, when it comes to extending IS7, uh, as I talked a bit about this morning, there's, there's a number of different ways to do that. Um, you know, primarily, most people are going to probably start to write things like modules and handlers. How many people have written HTTP modules or HTTP handlers out there? Show of hands. Couple of you. So for those of you who have, I mean, you've you've basically conquered that first step of extending IS7. Not a whole lot has actually changed from the uh, the extension aspect of things. What what has changed is they've enabled a bunch of new things that um, that uh, that you can get access to, and we'll go through the, those in in uh, the, this next little bit, and I'll show you a little bit of those in action. Um, where they've really gone above and beyond is extending a lot of the, uh, the management infrastructure, whether it be the configuration model or the, the plug-in to the management tools, both command line, programmatic interfaces, and, and the UI. And, and this is a really kind of key thing because when you're developing extensions and trying to build add-on product for IS6 or you know, basically customize it if you want for your application, it was really quite challenging. You ended up having to do all kinds of crazy com interop or you know, pull out and dust off old C++ and, and probably hurt yourself with some pointer arithmetic there. Um, you know, I know my C++ is any, anything, you know, not, not very good. So, um, so that was a, a, a key component when they built uh, IS7. They were saying, you know, hey, we've, we've got to make it easy to extend upon. And to do that, they, they did a lot of, you know, eating their own dog food, which is the, the term inside Microsoft. And uh, essentially by saying that, they, they built IS7 on top of the same infrastructure and foundation and APIs that you and I will build on top of. So there's no hidden APIs, there's no fancy Microsoft only things. If you, want, if you think you can build a better HTTP compression module or you want to write a specialized SSL uh, handler that will take advantage of some hardware component or offloading device, you can do that and rip and replace and not have to worry about not being able to access everything. You'll have full fidelity access to everything that the IS product team has. And to that effect, um, what you can do, there's this great little tool called Reflector, and if you haven't discovered it, you're going to actually need it over these next couple of months as they try and crank out the documentation. Reflector essentially is a disassembler for uh, the Microsoft.NET uh, IL framework, and it will allow you to look inside what's happening uh, in, in the, the, the tool or the, the extensions that the Microsoft folks have built. And it's actually a lot of how I've learned how to build management extensions was simply poking around at, at the stuff that they've built. One of the easiest ones you can start with as, as you get into the management UI is probably the SSL module if you want to use Reflector to learn. It's, it's kind of a fairly simplistic implementation, not a lot going on, so you can kind of get the gist of what's going on. But we'll, we'll actually go through uh, a bit of example. I'll, t I'll talk to you a little bit about the, the infrastructure required for uh, building out on, uh, on the, the environment. So with that, I've got my slide deck back here. I'm just going to let my virtual machine boot up in the background here since I will uh, 
need that at some point here so I can actually get out of the slides and show you some real code. All right, now that that's running. So pretty much the, the four sections that I really want to dig in today are the handlers, the modules, the configuration, and the management. Those are the, the kind of four main sections that you're going to touch in and extend. That being said, there are a few other things that we won't have time to cover, like the, the trace diagnostics. So you, you're actually able to go in and write new ways to consume tracing information. And that's particularly useful if you're working on things like management tools and you want to detect the health status of um, uh, of IIS and, and be able to report on that. I believe there's a, a product um, somewhere here in the area, AdventNet, they write an op manager product that's able to do operations management on various products. For somebody like them, they'd be really interested in some of the tracing APIs and being able to consume those, those, that, those events natively. And that, that just saves a whole lot of parsing of event logs and really kind of crude ways of getting at information. Instead, what they're doing is exposing that to you so you can get the raw information in, in a form that's actually quite useful. So that's, that's certainly, uh, you know, again, it, that, that underlying theme of full fidelity APIs in, in terms of being able to access everything. Quick overview of the infrastructure and the architecture for those, again, who weren't at uh, the, the talk a little bit earlier in the day. Um, the IS7 architecture has evolved a little bit further. IS5 to 6 was a major jump. It, it went to that idea of application pools and isolation, introduced the, the notion of the worker process. What they did in IS7 is they took out uh, and all of the kind of core request management bits that are really kind of generic. They don't, they don't actually make uh, makes sense as just an HTTP only thing. In other words, handling an FTP request and queuing that request, it's the same sort of concept, it's just a different protocol. Well, they, they took all of that stuff and they, they pulled it out and built um, this thing called Windows Process Activation Service. And what it really is, is all that generic request management type stuff. And so if you're building, let's say, Windows Communications Foundation Service, and you don't want to have to set up IS to host and stuff, you can go directly into WAS and host off of it. So WAS is a really, for anybody building any sort of service, WAS is the thing. And it ships with Windows Vista and Windows Server 2008. It's something that you really ought to know about uh, because that's the underlying fundamental, that's the engine that, that powers both IS and, and a bunch of other uh, stuff out there. The other things they've done is they've, they've gone and, and uh, moved a lot of the HTTP work to the kernel mode. And for those who, who don't understand the, or haven't looked into the, the way Windows works on that sense, there's user mode and kernel mode. User mode has all kinds of safeguards so you can't hurt yourself. Kernel mode gives you raw access to uh, the processor so that you can do stuff fairly quickly. And so they've done that from a performance perspective after really kind of hardening up and, and debugging that HTTP uh, listener. Um, the other big thing is they introduce two modes of pipelines. I'll go through the classic one in a second, but the integrated one's the one that you want to know about. This is really, again, that, 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 that foundational shift in the architecture they took from 6 to 7. In 6, which is, was the classic pipeline, there's a lot of repetitive work, and you'll see that in a second. In 7, they took a lot of the events that were happening, and, the, and for ASP.NET developers, this looks very familiar. Um, and they basically ran all the, the modules through it. What's new for ASP.NET developers is log requests. That's something that was never accessible to us before. On top of that, there's a bunch of properties, and I'll highlight those in, in just a little bit, that actually now become writable. In the past, because the way ASP.NET was, was architected under the IS6 model, we just we weren't in the right place at the right time to be able to write to certain pieces of information, and now we actually get full access to that. So we're really first-class citizens in the world of IS7 and being able to do and build pretty much anything. And that's a really good thing because, again, good C++ is really hard to do. And, you know, we, I've been following modules like Helicon's the Sappy Rewrite Filter, and they're releasing new builds every other week because it's just those little nuance bugs in C++ because of the complexities of the language and the environment that keep eating them and they're, you know, 100 builds into their, their new release uh, of, of their product. And it's a great product, don't get me wrong, but it just shows you that here are some guys that are really C++ gurus and they struggle with the, the C++ world. And that's what I like about .NET. It's a little more straightforward. There's a lot of stuff around memory management and some of the foundational bits taken care of for you so you can focus on the real problem at hand, which is doing something cool and unique to your business. In the classic pipeline, this is actually how IS6 worked. And, and so they built an emulation mode because part of IS7 was compatibility. We want to be able to pull in 
old IS6 apps and be able to host them so that you, you're not stuck on Windows Server 2003. You can get up to 08, take advantage of all the great features in 08, and, and still be able to run your app. And you can see here the redundancy. So IS runs through its pipeline. It does some authentication bits, gets down to execute handler and says, hey, this is an ASP.NET app, fires it through the ASAPI uh, handler, and then it starts the whole process over again. And you can see there's, there's quite a bit of redundancy there. And it really, it was a challenge for guys like IT pros. You know, they're, they're sitting there trying to troubleshoot why authentication wasn't working. And they didn't understand that forms auth and basic authentication were two completely separate modules in the world of IIS-6. They ran in different spaces. They, did, they kind of understood each other, but they didn't. And so IIS-7 simplifies a lot of that. It simplifies it for us as developers. It simplifies it for the IT pros when it comes to debugging. and opens up a ton of opportunity to say, you can rip and replace every module inside IIS. I think that's pretty cool. For those who haven't written modules or handlers, just a brief synopsis of what I'm really talking about. Modules essentially plug into the process for, for all requests. So whether I'm asking for a JPEG file, an ASP.NET page, or just doing a random kind of server-side call to some web service, the modules essentially run in that stack and make choices or changes to the way things are executing based on a bunch of conditions. So a great example would be, let's say you've got you know, some sort of custom authentication source, you're going against an RSA secure ID and you need to hit up the RSA server and do the authentication against that. Well, you can plug into the authentication stack and essentially create an RSA secure ID authentication provider. Let's say you want to, again, offload uh, compression or do some work with an appliance that you're working on and have IES intelligently know how to pass information to that appliance. So you can insert yourself into the compression stage and be able to work with that appliance. So that's what modules are all about. They're, they're general purpose tasks that happen inside the stack. On the other hand, you've got handlers, which are specific to various uh, types of requests. So I want to say an ASPX page. That goes to the ASPX page factory handler, which handles the interpretation, compilation, and execution of that particular page. Likewise, you've got a static file handler that says, hey, I'm looking for a JPEG file. I don't need to do anything with it. I just need to read the bytes off the disk and send them down the line with the appropriate MIME type attached to the uh, response header. And so handlers are more about specific types of requests. And, and they can be absolutely useful. Um, you, again, if you've coded in ASP.NET for some time now, you've probably run into a couple of those handlers. Trace.axd is, is one in particular. Um, you, know, you probably went looking for the file at one point when you first discovered it, realized, hey, there is no trace.axd. Well, it's a handler. It's picked up as part of the stream and says, I see a request for trace.axd. I'm going to go and, and return some information to the user. And you can also, again, reflector in and see that, that in, in action. What was changed under the covers in terms of some of the methods and properties and stuff like that? It's good to know that the, the HTTP module, the handler, and the, the async handler are all just really the .NET 2.0 um, interfaces. There's nothing new there. They didn't add anything um, funky to those, those interfaces. They're pretty much your standard ASP.NET 2.0 stuff. So when the Framework 2 shipped, they shipped ahead, uh, thinking ahead, especially with Vista shipping at the time, and attached all the stuff that they would need for IIS 7. They added a bunch of new events, but they also made a few changes to a few of the properties. Um, in particular, map request handler, so you can directly influence inside ASP.NET which request handler that you want to, to, to serve up a particular page. Um, that was something that was reserved for IIS to make that decision. Because if you remember back in the classic mode, the map handler was actually already handled by the time it got to ASP.NET. It picked the ASAPI uh, filter for ASP.NET and did its thing. So you were well past that stage by that point. Log request was another one that wasn't accessible. And again, this one becomes interesting because now for the first time, if you're looking at server logs, the forms auth user ID ought to start showing up in the user field on the, uh, the, the logs. And that, that means for all those guys running web trends or sawmill or some of the other log processing tools, we can actually get good user data now off our forms applications where before we really couldn't get that data. We had to correlate it in different ways and get really funky with SQL and stuff like that. The other thing as well is your request and response headers now become fully writable. That's something that, again, we didn't have in the, the previous environment just because of the stage that we we're being called at. And uh, so it allows us to influence various items down the stack. 
And so you could insert headers at the point that you do a request, and you could just do it authenticated equals yes, and some module down the stack or handler can pick up and read on that. You can disable kernel cache, and this, is, this has to do with how the caching operates, and if you're doing any sort of or any sort of uh, caching that depends on the user that's authenticated, and that authentication happens outside of kernel mode, so chances are forms auth is a great example of that, um, you'll, you'll want to make sure that it doesn't get cached in the kernel mode. Again, it's that idea that kernel mode's really fast and, and really optimized, but there's some things it just doesn't have access to because it's too dangerous to access it down at that level. And so now we've got a specific call for some of those situations to say, hey, I'm about to do stuff and return data, and that that's, that's really kind of specific stuff that you, not, you should not cache in the kernel. Server variables is another one of those where we can go ahead and, and, and influence it because now we're part of the server. We can declare variables. I think that's, you know, again, one of those, those key things there that, uh, that uh, were important. Some of these changes actually happened through the .NET th uh, Framework 3.5 distribution. We'll actually take a look at, at uh, some of that stuff and how, you, how it actually ends up in, the, in the, uh, the framework itself. We'll pull out Reflector and take a peek. Um, preconditions are another one of those things if you're working on modules and handlers today in the IS6 world and you've got to move to IS7. Or even if actually you're writing IS7 uh, uh, modules, let's say you're doing a reference to a COM object. For those that have worked with COM, you know that 32-bit COM objects only work in a 32-bit world. Well, now you can actually say that, you know, hey, I've written this forms auth module and, you know, in this case it says I need to run under managed code. But you could also say, you know, I need 32-bit because I'm calling a 32-bit COM object. And so it will spin up a 32-bit worker process, assuming everything else falls in line, and allow you to run. And that's, again, something new to IS7 where you can run 32-bit and 64-bit side by side. It used to be one or the other in IS6. And so you'd end up deploying more servers because you had that one app that was 32-bit that would never get upgraded to 64-bit. Now you can bring them all under one server. And that makes management and reduce the uh, costs of running things a whole lot better. So let's uh, dig into uh, building a, a managed handler here. Let's uh, pop open uh, a few things here, make sure everything's uh, live and in stereo. So Visual Studio grinds here in the background. We'll attempt to drag it over. Oh, it disappeared. Come on. It's the downside of rebooting your machine mid-demo. Uh, mid so I've got um, just a, a, a solution with not a whole lot in it. I've got some of the, the can code in case something uh, doesn't work so that, oops, I kicked something. Nope, nope, we're good. All right. Um, let's go ahead and uh, spark up a new project. and. And so when it comes to managed handles, you're going to see there's no real magic here. I'm going to start a new project. I'm going to pick a class library, and I'm going to call it the server time handler, because we'll just create a little handler that returns the time on the server. Um, oh, server time handler 2, because apparently I already have one. So it's going to give me a class. I'm going to go ahead and rename it to server time, uh, not handler. And then I will go ahead and add a reference to system.web. Of course, first time loading, so it's going to grind here for a second. The um, you know, system.web that I'm grabbing is just your standard old system.web. Nothing, uh, nothing fancy there. System.web. So then I'll using system.web, I HTTP handler. Again, for those of you that wrote handlers, this is, there's no real magic here. You just right click on it, implement uh, the abstract class, and you'll have uh, just a few methods that, uh, or implement interface, you'll have just a few methods that you have to implement. One of them is, is reusable, so that's one of those kind of uh, memory conservation performance ones. Um, so if, if you're doing just one-off operations that don't really need to know state and you don't need to tear down the entire object, you can just simply return true and we'll do that here. Um, that's you know, really good from a, a perf perspective and you want to be conscious of that. If it's not reusable, you, gotta, you want to ask yourself why because 
every request that comes in will then have to spark up a separate instance of that handler, and then that creates a whole bunch of objects in memory that uh, you may not need. The next thing we're going to do is implement process request, and I've got uh, some code in a can here to, uh, to do it. It's nothing fancy here. It's just simply going to sit there and look at the request query string, look for a parameter, and if it does, it's going to parse it. Otherwise, it's going to go ahead and return a time. And, and I'm keeping it simple just to say you can do anything at this point. You know, there's examples of people sitting there manipulating images, applying watermarks to it. There, um, we use handlers that work to pull um, data from a SQL database and then fire that out to the user. In particular, we do our digital um, music in that sense, in that way. So we just do an open stream reader take the data and just forward that off to the client. You can pretty much do anything you want at this point uh, within it. So just to show you a quick example of, of how this might work, let's go ahead and build that. And in the background here, it's going to go ahead and build. Um, the, the next thing I'm going to do is uh, going to copy that over to the, the server. And so I'm, I'm not going to do anything too, too fancy. I'm just going to pop open Windows, uh, Windows Explorer here. Of course, if this were production, I'd be uh, focused on making sure that I had a, uh, a proper deployment strategy. But uh, since for the purpose of the demo, we'll keep it nice and simple. So I'm just going to go to web server, root, bin. I'm going to drop it right into my bin file. And, and here comes the neat thing. In, in IS Manager, it's going to automatically pick this up. So in the past, I used to have to do a whole lot of stuff around trying to remember, okay, what's, what's the fully qualified name, et cetera, et cetera. IS has got some intelligence now to query the bin folder and pick up a lot of that data for you. So it makes it really, really easy to test. So let me just pull IS Manager over here. And uh, IS Manager, um, as well, has gotten a whole lot better. And, and again, if you missed this morning, um, you missed uh, some of the, the demo of this. But uh, needless to say, it's, it's, it's way better. Um, it's just warning me, I've got a self-signed certificate for connecting to the management service on my back end. And so it's going to go ahead and pop it open. I'm going to look at the server level. And then I'm going to drill down to the default website. I'm going to find the HTTP handler section or handler mapping. I'm going to open that up. And I'm going to add up here in the actions corner, add managed handler. And it's going to sit there and spin. And right now it's enumerating essentially the, the bin folder to uh, see what's there. I'm going to drop it down, and it's going to give me a list of all the various handlers I have. There's our server time handler, too. And I'm going to say for any request to star dot um, rockstar, um, I'm going to send it through that uh, server time handler, and we'll call it server time handler. And then as well, I've got request restrictions. And this is, this is actually something that, that's neat. This is URL scan from IS6 being incorporated into IS7. So they've said, you know, there's a lot of scary things that happen out there. And as a web server, we shouldn't just allow anything through to our uh, particular um, uh, items out there. So I'm going to say, I only want to process get requests because you know, I'm not doing posts. I'm not doing puts. I'm not doing any of the other various HTTP verbs out there. Of course, I got to spell it right. Um, and uh, so basically hit OK. And then I'm going to go ahead and pop open a web browser in the, uh, the corner here. And then we'll go ahead and make a, uh, a quick request to, uh, to see that this is working. So we'll do HTTP web server slash URA dot rockstar. So it's going to go and, and turn in the background, load up my worker process for the first time. And then hopefully, if all goes well, we'll get the, uh, the time on the server back. And there we go. So that's, that's the basics of creating a handler. It's, it's a fairly simple process. What you do with it is really the magic. It's, it's really deciding what makes sense for your application. So if you want to pull, pull into a database and pull data out, if you want to um, you know, uh, you know, pre-process files and send it back, you know, really pretty much anything. Where you see, just start to see some of this actually really implemented, if you haven't seen the ASP.NET uh, Dynamic Data Services and the ADO.NET Data Services, um, they're doing some really interesting stuff with the handlers where essentially you can use the URL to navigate right through your database. And it, it spits out um, various forms of XML, whether it be RSS, JSON, Atom, 
uh, Pox and a few other uh, uh, type feeds. And so they're, they're doing some really interesting stuff around getting data out onto the wire um, through building just a, a, an HTTP handler that uh, goes into the database and exposes that data. Um, it's, it sounds scarier than it is. There's security and all that stuff around it. It's not just that simple. You can't do a select star or delete star from table or anything like that. So, so that's really all there is to building a handler. And, and that being said, there, there are a few things to uh, consider with the handler. Um, like anything, don't over-deploy it because it's going to need to be evaluated at every step of the way. And that's, that's one of those themes with IS7 that, in general, I would encourage for anybody doing web server deployment is sit there and look at what is required. In IS6, there's things like the passport, or in, in ASP.NET and IS6, there's the passport authentication module that was loaded as part of your default configuration. And I'm not sure about you, but from what I can recall, there's only a handful of sites actually doing passport authentication, if that anymore. And so, you know, all of your web servers out there on IS6, if you haven't gone and removed that, you've wasted a whole bunch of processing and memory. And it's not a ton, but you've wasted some CPU cycles to this, this module. And, and I'd say the same with handlers. The more fine grain that you can get it in your web config, the better. And, and to aid that is the configuration subsystem. You can now define that in a web doc config and have that carry with your application everywhere. In, in the days of IS6, you had to worry about the impacts of the meta base and how that all played out. And deploying the meta base changes were absolutely horrible. The other thing as well is async handlers. And, and this whole notion of async actually came in in ASP.NET 2.0. And we could spend an entire session talking about a, uh, async processing. But the idea is that your request pool, your, your, your thread pool for ASP.NET is limited in size. And the last thing you want to do is go out and spend three minutes querying the database and have ASP.NET blocking. Because what's going to happen is you'll hit very quickly the extent of that thread pool, and your next request is going to get one of those lovely 503 service unavailable messages because it can't go in and handle the request. It's simply server too busy uh, to uh, be able to return that request. And again, it's that idea that, you know, when you're out doing something, they've built in some intelligence and some framework to say, you can go out and do that. We're just going to put that to, to sleep, put it to the side, and then we're going to return that thread to the pool to service other shorter requests in the meantime. So the async model is something that, again, if you're going to build handlers, I'd really seriously consider if you're doing any sort of external resource lookup or any sort of long-running operation where you can hand the, the, the stuff back. It will make your application infinitely more scalable uh, in, in the long run. Um, so definitely take a look at the, the async handlers. They're, they're really, I, I don't have a ton of time to go into it, but they've gotten a, a whole lot easier to, to build. Modules are not a whole lot different, but they are at the same time. And so let, let's go ahead and take a look at what it would take to, uh, to build a module. So I'm going to uh, scroll over here. I'm going to go ahead and start another project, just add new project class library, and we'll call it transport security module, because we're going to use it to evaluate the, um, the ability for the page to be processed using HTTP or HTTPS. So it's going to sit there and look at the page and look at the request and say, should I be putting, should that be an HTTP request? And it, if the answer is yes and it's not, it will do that redirection. It's actually a common request that a lot of people have. How do I auto switch people from HTTP to HTTPS? And in IS6, there's a lot of hacks where people would go and edit the, the uh, error pages and put in ASP pages so it would sit there and read things and, and, and do all kinds of hacky things. Well, you don't actually have to do that anymore. You can just implement a module that uh, does that. And you could do it in ASP uh, or in IS6. The only problem was it really didn't work unless you hacked it to do JPEG files or any of the other types of files. Now you can build something that does everything. So let's go ahead and, and same sort of uh, process as before. We're just going to go ahead and add a reference to the system.web. And then we're going to go ahead and uh, transport security module is my class. I'm going to implement system.web.ihttp module. And then I'm going to go ahead and right click on it or use the little widget here to implement the interface. And I'm going to get, a, again, a two functions that, uh, that I have to go back and implement. Now, here, again, the, the things aren't 
um, too, too complex. Dispose is really saying, hey, when the module's done and I'm, I'm, I'm exiting, make sure you clean up. And, and it's one of those things where, again, in the .NET world, we're not really used to disposing like we were in the COM world. In COM, if you didn't dispose, you, got cert you basically got a leak in your application. You should always be checking all of the objects you reference to see if they have a dispose method, if they derive from I disposable. If they do, it's up to you to call that dispose. If you wait for the garbage collector, it will do it over time if they implemented it right, but it's a long time. It's got to go through all the generations of the garbage collection heap to be able to get disposed. So, so be responsible, look for dispose, and, and make sure that you, you actually dispose of things properly. For now, I'm just going to skip it just for the, the sake of uh, what's going on here. But uh, the next thing I'm going to do is go into the, the init. And I'm going to take my context. And this is where I wire up all the various uh, events here. Now, as you scroll down here, again, remember, I'm in ASP.NET 2.0. I've got this log request. Well, hey, what's log request going on, working here? I didn't have that back in the days of, uh, of IS6. You know, if, if I ran that, what would the server do? Well, that's, that's a fantastic question. What would the server do? So let's pull up our good old uh, friend reflector here, and let me just uh, bring it over to the other uh, side here. So for those of you who have not seen, be prepared to see the best tool since sliced bread. It's, uh, let's go to code font, let's blow it up here a little bit so you can see. What reflector does allows me to look for stuff. So I'm going to go ahead and look for the HTTP application. And I'm going to go ahead and look for log request, and I'm going to pop, pop that open. So here's log request as it exists in the .NET Framework 2.0. So it, part, it starts off by saying, if not HTTP runtime, use integrated pipeline, throw an exception. Otherwise, please go ahead and hook it up. So, so in, in, when they were working on the .NET Framework 2.0, as I mentioned, they're working on Vista at the same time, and Vista was the first shipment of IS7. So IS7 has actually been out for quite some time. They built in all of this stuff to say, hey, we know we're going to have an integrated pipeline, and we're going to build this into the framework. So when, when that comes around on the server side, you don't have to worry about service packing everything to be able to get access to it. So if you've got .NET 2, you can access a lot of the, these bits and pieces. That being said, there is still stuff coming out. .NET 3.5 Service Pack 1 has got a bunch of stuff around cache handling and a few other things that, that are, that are uh, net new that you ought to start looking at as far as uh, if you're doing any kind of serious scalable work. So this is really what the event handler looks like, but we don't care about a log request right now. We're just going to go pretty simple. We're going to plug into begin request because we want to get as early in in the process as possible. So I'm going to uh, go ahead and define a, a new handler. So let's press enter to, nope. All right, I'm going to see you. begin request. And I don't have anything defined. So I'm just going to go ahead and uh, void begin request. It's your typical object sender, event args E. And so my begin request method, this is where, again, the magic happens in terms of my module. So I can hook up to any event, all events, whatever I want in terms of this particular module. And then again, it's, it's like the handler, now you do stuff. And what it is that you want to do, it's really up to you. So I, you know, again, in the effort of time, what I did is I, I wrote some code here, and I'll, I'll walk you through it, where, where I went and built um, some stuff to, uh, oh, i got to add a using statement. Um, where I went, built some stuff to take a look at the connection. So it just, it looks at the sender and it pulls the HTTP application out of there. It pulls out the request and the response. And then it evaluates whether or not we have a secure connection. And I've actually found this as just a quirk with IS6. And I'm not actually sure if it applies to IS7 or not. So I just keep doing it because it, it makes me feel better. But I've noticed sometimes that request.issecureconnection in the older ASP.NET 1X days never always, it didn't always return true when the connection was actually secure. Some weird things going on there. So I, I just go in and poke at the server variable directly and say, hey, if it's set to on, then chances are I'm secure. Otherwise, also check this is secure connection. So that's just me being extra careful um, because it's one of those security type operations. If it is and it's not a secure connection, I'm going to go ahead and, and build a redirect URL 
that's, that takes in the existing URL and redirects it to HTTPS. And so if, if that actually is happening, I'm going to append the path, the query string, and I'm going to call a response.redirect and send it on its way. So it's a fairly simple module. I'm just kind of saying there, hey, is this a, a, an unsecure request? Then I'm going to make it secure by doing a response.redirect. This is something that you might have baked into an ASP.NET page. Wouldn't be uncommon back in the ASP.NET kind of 1x, early 2x days where you, you just build it right into the page layer because that login page or that, that financial data page required to be secure. Really, at the end of the day, why it's important to build it into a module and not a page is because a page is about executing behaviors and logic. It's not about the transport method. So you, if you built it into the page, and here, here's a great example, and later bought an SSL offloading tool, you'd actually go have to go and, and redeploy your application because you'd have to go edit your page to say, oh, by the way, we've got this SSL offloading thing, so my server doesn't see things as secure anymore, or it sees it differently. In a module, you could leave your, your core application logic alone and either replace the module with something the vendor has shipped to you, replace the module with your own, or just take out the module altogether and say, I just trust that all requests are secure. So that separation of concerns is really quite important in terms of overall maintainability of your code. Your ASP.NET page should focus on stuff related to the page, not the stuff around the page. It shouldn't be worried about trying to authenticate people or being able to check to see if a connection is secure. That's the function of the infrastructure that you're building and the underlying HTTP module. So let's go ahead and, uh, and uh, build this out. Now I'm going to pull up IS Manager. Go to my modules. Add Manage Module. It's going to do the same sort of thing. It's going to churn through, check out my bin folder, and it's going to allow me to pick the various things that I, uh, I want to add in. In this case, it's my transport security module. And there's an interesting little checkbox here. And again, you know, things to be aware of and look for these little nuances. This invoke only uh, for request to ASP.NET applications or managed handlers allows you to say that this module only applies to managed code. If you don't check that, it'll apply to JPEGs, GIFs, static files, PHP applications, et cetera, et cetera. And it's, it's actually through this kind of differentiation that you can do interesting things like have PHP applications use forms authentication from ASP.NET. So you kind of have a blending or a hybrid application out there as far as runtime environments. So that checkbox is actually kind of important. They leave it unchecked by default because they want to actually encourage you to build modules for the system as a whole, not just for ASP.NET. And I, oh, no, there we go. I power, oh, actually hang on one sec. So let's go ahead and uh, hit up the web server now and see what we get back. So I'm just going to do HTTP web server. And it's going to go out there and grind away for the request. And it's just about to redirect me. It's passing back a certificate. It's a self-signed certificate. So it's just complaining about the name. And now it says HTTPS web server. So again, very simple to build modules uh, within the, the scope of, of, uh, of IS. Um, but there's still a lot more to it. And that's what I want to get on to next. A few things, again, to consider with modules, kind of like handlers and everything else, you got to watch what you're doing from a resource perspective, especially if you're building modules that execute for every request. It's not just ASP.NET. You should really look for ways to, to get out of processing if you're not going to do anything for things like static files. If you've got a very specific scope of operation, try and determine that as early on as possible before you allocate all kinds of resources, before you make a SQL connection or whatever it is you're doing, and just get out of that request. Because you're, you've now got a lot of power, but you've also got a lot of power to slow down the server quite a bit. So try and look for ways to get out of the HTTP module in places where you don't play very, very quickly. The other thing is exception management. Um, there's, uh, you know, it, modules when they crash, you know, bring down the entire server uh, or the entire request and stop the worker process and then cause everything to recycle. It's not pretty. So you really got to consider how are you handling exceptions. Don't use exceptions for flow control. Actually use exceptions for exceptional circumstances where it ought to bring down the server because nobody anticipated how to handle with that. And so there's, there's some things there that have gotten me in the past as we built modules, things like I've, I'll assume that session state 
is actually enabled and is a module as part of the server. Well, one of the good things about IS7 and one of the bad things is I can actually now remove session state so the server knows nothing about session state. Well, if I'm writing a module that has some sort of dependency on there, it want to do some checking of the stack to make sure that any dependencies do exist before you start. And then if they don't exist, fail gracefully. Just don't run, don't process, maybe write an event to the tracing infrastructure or uh, write an event uh, out to the event log or something. But make sure that you don't do things that will cause the environment to crash. The other thing to consider as well is you're running inside code access security trust levels. So if you're building for medium trust environments, especially a lot of shared hosting environments, your module's got to play by those same rules. And so you'll have to uh, be aware of all the implications of code access security. And I know it's one of those things that you know, still confuses me to this day in terms of how exactly it works. It was, you know, in my sense, there's a lot of great ideas there, but just poorly executed in terms of the overall implementation. The distributed configuration model, this is really, to me, an exciting part of building applications on IS7. Now they're actually first class citizens as far as configuration. My IS manager can snap into them. My command line tools can actually configure my custom applications. I don't have to write all kinds of extra infrastructure just to go set a bit in an XML file. I can just call app command or go in through WMI and set a, a config section that I would normally have written code in the past to. So they're, they're reducing a whole bunch of work that you need to do to configure and deploy your web applications. And again, I think that's, that's really critical for us because we've all probably written the same piece of code over and over and over to do the same simple thing. So they've kind of boiled that up to the top. How do you, uh, how do you do this? How do you extend the uh, configuration? Well, let's just take a, a quick peek at that. So it starts simply by saying that there's an XML file that's a schema file. So let's go ahead and add a new item. Let's go ahead and add um, XML file. And I'm, oh, where is my XML? There it is. So I'm going to write uh, tsm underscore schema dot xml. The name's kind of arbitrary. It's whatever you feel like. Um, the xml file is uh, um, really not all that uh, fancy. In fact, actually, if you go into the server, there's a, uh, a sample uh, xml file here. Let me just pull that up um, called, uh, called is schema. And it's actually, well, it's not really a sample. It's the base xml file. But in the, the configuration and in the comments, it uh, walks you through all the various uh, scenarios um, that, uh, or all the various uh, attributes that you can have. So let me just uh, bring that up here. So that's in the Windows System 32 um, inet serve uh, config directory. inet serve is pretty much the place to be as far as configuration bits. And uh, let me just pull that over to the other window here. And uh, what you can see here is uh, essentially all the, uh, all the various uh, add-ons to ASP.NET have their own files. So if you look at the top here, what they've done is, again, in lieu of actually writing full-on documentation yet, they're working on that. They've introduced a whole ton of comments to tell you, here's all the various options and what you can do with it. What's really quite interesting is they've thought about a lot of the, the scenarios, like making sure that that field is required. Should it be unique? Um, you know, should it be encrypted? That's, you know, fair, you know, if you're doing like merchant IDs or passwords or something like that, you can enforce the idea that that's encrypted. There's basic validation and it is very basic, but it certainly works. Um, they've dealt with collections and elements, so you can do all those fancy add remove collections. Stuff that in, especially the ASP.NET 1X days, was brutally hard. And they introduced a lot of stuff in 2.0 to make it easier, and they've uh, allowed you to describe that in the schema. So what does it look like? You pretty much start off with, this is my section. It's going to start at system.applicationhost slash blah. And here are all the various elements and attributes that I can have. So I'll show you as it relates to the uh, transport uh, security module. And again, just you know, nobody wants to see me type, so I'll just pre-type it all here. But basically it says that I'm going to define a schema section in system.webserver. It's going to be called transport security. I'm going to have an attribute on it called mode, and I'm going to set it to true. Now, if I really wanted to get fancy, I could have an enum. You know, I could do like custom has in ASP.NET and have a remote only on and off. Um, you can get as fancy as you want with your typical configuration stuff. But for the sake of time, I just didn't want to uh, spend all the time uh, in that. Um, I also pulled in a string. And again, you could 
get really fancy, add a whole add remove collection of uh, various pages that you want to say are secure. For the sake of this, it's just securing everything, every request that comes in. Um, so, so that's you know, pretty much all there is to, to uh, creating a schema file. It's just writing some XML. Once you're done with that XML, you have to do a little bit of deployment. And that deployment involves a, a fairly kind of quick process. You really just go grab your, um, your XML file. You go to your web server into your C drive, Windows, System32, INET serve, INET serve, config, schema folder, and you place in uh, your, your transport security uh, module schema. I'm just going to delete my, my old one, which I probably shouldn't do that. Ah, that's right. Uh, um, so to pretty much drop that in, that's pretty much it. You know, you drop the file in, and that's actually now almost fully accessible, except there's one more thing. You actually have to allow the, uh, the schema to uh, function properly. So to do that, there's the application host config, and this is the server level configuration. We have to just go in and say that that section is actually allowed to be under system.webserver. And so I've, I've just done that ahead of time. So I've said, Here's my section, it's called transport security, and everyone can override it. I could also say it can only be defined at the server level, don't allow any websites to override it, et cetera. There's a bunch of delegation stuff there to, that, uh, that can be controlled. So with that in place, what that allows me to do is to actually start uh, manipulating the, the configuration on the server. So what I'm going to do here um, is I'm going to go ahead and uh, pull up a, a command prompt here. And I'm going to go ahead and, and uh, change to my uh, projects folder. And I'm going to run RS. RS as a command file is just calling Windows Remote Shell and, and doing a remote command execution. So I'm going to do RS, C Windows, System32, INET serve, app con command.exe. So remember, this is one of those command line tools for management. I'm going to do list config. Um, dash section colon system dot web server slash transport security. So I haven't recompiled app, config, app command, I haven't done anything, and automatically I can start manipulating and, and playing with my configuration values as if it were any other one built into the framework. So let's go ahead and set a value, so let's go set config, um, and then we'll just do mode false. And then I'm just going to go ahead and do a list. And it's going to run remotely, return my results in a second, and now my mode is false. I mean, that, that's really all there is to extending the schema for the configuration at that level. Now, there's, of course, a lot further you can go, and that's building a whole configuration section and building a management UI. And again, we'll just dig into that in but a moment. Um, so let's just blast through the, the architecture and get back to the uh, code here for a second. So it's infinitely more interesting. Um, before we jump into the management console and how that builds out, um, there's a couple things to know. They, they spent a lot of time thinking about how do we do little modules that do very, you know, kind of single task things. Um, and so they spent time saying, you know, we need a UI component. And that really should just be focused on putting text boxes and check boxes on the, on the screen and pulling the data from that. We need a module service proxy. And this is not unlike your web service proxy today. It calls off to a service that's running on the server. And then underlying that service, it's going to call off to a provider which does all the, the underlying bits and pieces of the, uh, the actual manipulation on the server. Now, because I'm, you know, I'm just building this today for configuration, that doesn't mean that you can't also do functions here. So let's say your module had a function to calculate you know, the 10th decimal value of pi. You could have the server do that and return that as well. And so some common things are things like the application pools snap in will go and recycle application pools. It's not just about configuration. You can also take action as part of your uh, environment. So I've only got about 10 minutes left, so we're going to uh, get going on this one here. And I'll, I'll talk you through as I uh, add the bits. Now, normally, you'd build this out into separate assemblies. I'm going to I'll pop up a, a quick slide with a uh, um, an element that, that talks to that. But the, um, what it is, there's basically server bits and client bits. And the reason you want separate assemblies is you want to have 
um, you want to be able to send just a small piece of code over to the IS manager client, especially if you're operating remotely. You don't want to have to spend all kinds of time uh, going in and, uh, and, and waiting for them to download big things. So let's go ahead and add the transport security module uh, service dot CS. And so what this is, this is the uh, underlying service for uh, the, that will uh, do the communication or be there for the client to call. And before I get there, as I build things out, there's a couple of references that I need to add as part of doing this. So let's just get those ahead of time. So I need system.windows.forms because I'm going to build a, a UI and it's, it's basically a, a big user control. So system.windows.forms. I'm going to go ahead and need to add as well the, um, the Microsoft, uh, or sorry, system.drawing. So that usually comes along with uh, WinForms. And then I've got to add two Microsoft uh, assemblies that sit in your INET serve directory, and that's Microsoft Web Administration and Microsoft uh, Web Management. So if I go to Browse here and I go see Windows, and again, if you're developing on Vista, all these assemblies are there and they exist and they're exactly the same as what's on the server. If I see Microsoft Web Administration, and then I add Microsoft web management. And those are all my uh, references there. I'm going to go ahead then and uh, pull the, uh, the code out of the hat here just because I've only got about 10 minutes here. And I'll walk you through the bits and pieces. So what I've got here for right out of the gate is I've got, um, I've got a, a management uh, service here. And you can see what it, essentially it's doing. It's um, Actually, I've got, got to get my usings in there. All right, um, so what I'm doing are a couple of things. First off, you know, the, the most important things are these two functions, the get configuration and set configuration. Those are the arbitrary methods that I'm exposing through the service. These aren't temp, they aren't required, they can be anything you want. I just happen to call them get configuration and set configuration. And to make things nice and easy, I'm uh, building in a, uh, a property bag and, and using that and sending that along. It's again, it's just basically a lightweight dictionary um, for, uh, for uh, processing uh, configuration values. Um, I've got a, a get section which goes in and gets the current configuration from whatever site I'm working on. And again, I'll, I'll post this code on my blog so that you can uh, get access to it. Uh, the next thing I'm going to go ahead and build out is a uh, configuration section for it to actually reference. And this is just basically strongly typing the uh, configuration information that I, uh, um, I've actually defined in that schema. So let's go ahead and add a new class, call it transport security module section.cs ex and it's nothing more than your typical um, configuration section that you've seen in ASP.NET and .NET in general. It's a bunch of get setters and then I've just got a, a static method to make things easier to, uh, to find. All right, and then the, uh, the next thing I need to add is a, a UI provider. So this is the, uh, the underlying provider that, connect, that I connect with at the management service level. So let's go ahead and add a transport security module UI provider.cs. And again, just for the sake of time, I'm going to go ahead and pull that out. And again, this thing is, is you know, it's really about definition and saying this is what I can do on the back end. It gives a bunch of configuration, like the section name for the configuration. It throws out um, a, a reference back to the, uh, the, the underlying UI element and what assembly it's in. So it, the IS manager knows where to find the, the, the reference to the user interface. Um, and then it allows me to do things like scoping. And scoping is kind of neat, actually. It, it allows me to say that this particular UI, UI component only applies at the server level or the folder level or the content level. It allows you to, to really basically say where, where you should be able to use it. So let's go ahead and uh, management uh, Microsoft dot manage web uh, management administration. All right. Um, actually, for the sake of time here, because I've literally got 
a short period of time. I'm just going to pull up my fully baked code here just to show you the, the underlying bit. So, so we just built the server bits out. The client bits are, are look uh, somewhat similar. So the proxy for that service class that we built with those two methods, get configuration and set configuration, all it's doing is actually calling it. And it derives from this module service proxy that has an invoke command. So if you've ever done reflection, for example, it's, it's kind of the same way. You, you basically say invoke, here's this method, I'm going to pass in a bunch of parameters, and I'm going to get stuff back. And there's no strong binding, and they've done this on purpose because they don't want you to have to send down the wire all the server assemblies. They want you to package up a nice little 15K assembly with your UI in it and send it down the wire to anybody managing remotely. They don't want you to have to send all kinds of bits. So they've made it um, you know, fairly uh, uh, loosely uh, typed for that purpose. Um, the, the other piece here is your module UI. And this is actually where it's going to, again, wire up some of the, the UI bits. So this is what tells IS manager Oh, by the way, here's all the bits that you need to wire up and connect to. And it's going to do things like saying, here's the actual UI implementation. Here's the name of the module, a brief description. Here are the sections it can appear under um, in there. And there's, there's pretty much, you can also define custom sections if you wish. And so it's, again, it's a lot of wire up information. The real meat and potatoes of the UI exists here in the, uh, the, the module dialog page called module UI page. And really what this is, if you've ever done WinForms, this is WinForms with a couple of extra attributes. This is the one area, though, where I think they, they actually got it kind of rough. And, and I'll show you why here. So your typical WinForms client, you'd expect to be able to double click and then turn around and get a designer. Except you're going to get this error here. And it's not really a very useful error. If you like the designer and you're like me and you're like, I can't remember WinForms to, to save me, you can do this little neat trick to, tempor to temporarily to, uh, to be able to save you some time. You can actually change it to a, a form object, to inherit from form. You can go back to your designer, close it out, reopen your page, and then design it as if you would a WinForms thing. And then when you're done designing it, you just go back to your code and back to the right piece of code, which I closed. And you go back to your code, and then you take out that system windows forms, and then you derive back from your management dialog. And what that's really going to do is it's going to write in all this stuff that you really don't want to write by hand and start figuring out pixel counts for. What you're going to implement as part of the model dot, or the, the, the uh, UI uh, uh, page class, though, is you're going to write out, up, up a bunch of things. And again, very poorly documented at this time. They're working on more documentation as it goes, but reflector sit there and look at the, the IS uh, SSL module, and you'll, you'll be able to put piece this all together. The service proxy is that reference back to my proxy that gets me connected to the server so I can do stuff. On activated is when the, 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 the item is opened up. It's basically the, the open event uh, or load event, and it, it goes, simply goes off to my service proxy, calls my method, and then binds some properties back. Again, that's an arbitrary method. It could do anything you want within the context of that page. And I'll show you very quickly one of the nifty new uh, add-ins they've done. Um, there's a bunch of just general properties to control state on the page. And then you've got a cancel handler if you want to cancel. So let's just show you just the final result of what this looks like. And I'll show you one of the other neat things here. It actually flashed to it earlier. Um, if I scroll down here. I've got, uh, I've got this neat little transport security icon. And you can put your own pretty icon in there. And there are my two uh, things. And I can bang apply. And, and uh, it'll go ahead and save that stuff back. Um, the, uh, that's, that's pretty much all that's required to take it. It's a little fuzzy right now. But again, reflector. Go take a look at the SSL one. Great starting point. It's nice and simple. I've got one minute left. I'll show you one of the other add-ins that they're working on. A really neat thing, real-time reports as to what's happening on my IS server. I really love this. This is all built on .NET and just shows you where they're actually extending this. And expect to see more. They're building in a, a little SQL management studio type thing into the IS interface so you can do basic database bits. Again, all built on .NET. So if you want to learn how they do it, pop open Reflector, go take a look at the code, and start building your own. 
Um, so they, they're really invested in, in adding more to this, and they really want to get you guys excited and build more for it for your, your own applications or you know, for new opportunities to build stuff as a, as a whole. So you know, bottom line, you know, more documentation coming out, but it's really not all that, that crazy scary. It's, you know, there's just a few kind of classes that you have to implement to make it happen. So the recommendation is split up your, the, the work that you're doing because you really want that lightweight module that, that gets transferred to the client. And so the, 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 the split that makes the most sense in my mind is you've got your actual HTTP module or handler assembly. You've got a server management assembly which contains the service, the provider, and the configuration bits. And then you've got that client UI assembly. And that's, this is the thing that's actually going to be sent across the wire if you ever try and remotely administer a server that implements this particular module UI. So that's the divide that I really recommend. It, it creates a really lightweight client UI, and it also keeps the, the module itself lean and mean for when it executes. Because you don't want all the server management stuff loading when you're executing stuff. There's, it makes no sense. You don't need it. Um, on the client side, if you're ever poking around trying to figure out where did it actually all go, file, uh, app data slash roaming, Microsoft Web Management 7.0 modules. That's just one of those little things that I was trying to figure out where did it actually go. Because on the server when you deploy it, you GAC util it, but on the client it just magically ends up somewhere. And that's actually where it, where it ends up. Another little tip, if you're sitting there and you're trying to figure out why your new version isn't appearing, uh, on your uh, remote client, recycle the web management service. It loads a bunch of stuff into memory, and as a result, uh, you know, it won't pick up on that new version until you recycle it. Some resources, a few things to take a look at. There's a bunch of articles off is.net. I made the URL a little easier to, uh, to remember. Um, that, that, again, are going through it. They're, they're building more every week. I mean, there's a whole bunch of articles that just went up in this past week. So keep an eye on there. Get onto the forums and ask questions. The entire IS product group is sitting there watching it. I'm there. There's a bunch of MVPs there uh, watching those, those, uh, those uh, forums. And it's, you can actually get your question answered fairly quickly. So it's a really great one. And it's not overly active in the sense that you don't get all kinds of noise. There's actually some really great questions being asked and some really great scenarios being proposed. There's an IS SDK that's slowly being written and revised. It, it touches on some of this stuff, but again, it, it really needs to be re revised again. And if you don't want to write that configuration section by hand, one of the guys out there went and wrote this fancy autogen util that will take that XML file and autogen the config section for you. Just a little time saver when you're, when you're developing modules. So I really recommend uh, taking a look at some of those, those resources out there. If you want to learn more, tomorrow we're talking about debugging web applications with IIS 7 um, because I'm sure you know, every one of us has had those situations where we get the call and say, hey, your app just failed in production. What's going on? Um, I know I have. And uh, so there's some really great tools in IIS 7 that I want to show you guys that will make your lives so much easier when it comes to production debugging. We'll also take a look at the realities of migrating 6 to 7 and what it takes to get things like ASP.NET 1.1 and ASP running under IIS 7. And then finally wrap up with uh, just general what's new in Visual Studio 08 for uh, web developers and talk a little bit about the forthcoming 3.5 Service Pack 1, which is really more a feature pack than a service pack. But that's, that's Microsoft for you. So thank you very much, folks. I hope you had a, a great day. And we have a question. So the question was, how is this different from an IS, or sorry, ASP.NET, we had the add handler section. Um, two places it's different. Um, the handlers now can handle all requests, not just ASP.NET requests. So if you wanted to handle, let's say, JPEG files in ASP.NET, you had to map star to the ASP.NET page factory. And from a processing flow perspective, there's a lot of repetitive work that went on just to handle a JPEG file. So pure efficiency is the first thing that you're going to get out of this. Um, from a programmatic perspective, there is no difference. Writing a handler for ASP.NET and writing a handler for IS7, they've tried to keep the model exactly the same. So you've, you've actually already written your first IS7 handler. Um, it's now just a matter of doing some testing to make sure uh, it works in the same manner under IS7. 
Um, but uh, it's really not a whole lot different. It's really a perf thing. It's, it's saying I'm going to cut down the requests and get in there as early on as possible. Um, so that's, that's the big difference. Great question. Any other questions? So the question was the single configuration file scenario for web farms. Um, I don't have a lot of time to get into it, but there's a great webcast on uh, deploying IS7 for web farms, and it talks about all the web farm stuff. Not just the single config, but a bunch of the other stuff. I would really recommend that. It's on the MSDN webcast. But essentially, there's a shared configuration thing. You check a box, point it to the directory to where all the web configs are, and you do that in all the servers, and now they start to read the web configs from there. And so you can make a change there, and it affects all nodes in your farm uh, right away. It's, it's really quite cool. And it, like, again, one of those things, once you've got more than two nodes, this, you know, the bane of your existence is replicating the metabase. This thing is making your life way easier. If you're not there yet, they just released a new tool called MS Deploy that does metabase replication. I haven't tried it yet. It just came out in beta 1. And it's supposed to be better than that really broken script called IS config that works most of the time, but when it doesn't, it causes you pain. So if you can't get there yet, there's some other tools out there. So the question is, what is delegation and logging in, in IS7? And actually, better, better just to show you than uh, try and uh, put a million words behind it, um, as soon as I can find my mouse cursor here. Um, so at the uh, server level, you'll, uh, you'll notice that uh, there's a, a bunch of settings around, um, which I may have to uh, TS into the box. We just pull up a terminal server. Essentially what it is, it allows you to say that, you know, let's say you're in a shared hosting environment. And as the shared hosting provider, I want to enable my people to control custom errors as an example. In the past, that's been easy in ASP.NET because we've had that, but not for IS as a whole. Um, you wouldn't be giving access to the metabase to your average client. Or even in a business scenario where you've got a shared web server, you don't really want to give everybody metabase access in IS6. And, and so now, essentially, with IS7 and the idea of we've moved everything to the web config, I can selectively choose now which properties I want to allow other people who are non-administrators on the box to be able to manage, and more importantly, lock out the things that I don't want them to manage. And so one of the examples, handlers and modules, they can totally tank a server if they're written improperly. You can really kill performance. And so your policy as a, a company may be, you can, you know, we'll only support modules that have been reviewed and approved by us. And so you can lock the modules and handler section to prevent people from being able to add their own modules and handlers there. Likewise, you can also take properties and say, I'm going to actually delegate and allow people to be able to set those, those properties. And so what they've done essentially is if they've made, uh, you know, they've exposed a lot of stuff that we've had in, in, in IS for uh, quite some time. And they've, they've made it essentially available to um, you know, the, the whole of IS.net. And, 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 and this is really important for the guys on classic ASP or you're doing PHP. You know, you want to be able to uh, you want to be able to go out and uh, get access to certain server features without having to put in a support ticket to say, "Hey, I need you to change the ASP.NET version from 1.1 to 2.0." Now you can expose it and have them do it themselves. Because really, at the end of the day, there's some functions there that you used to do that you had no value of, other than the fact that it's you doing it. There, there's really no value for you to do that. So if you look at feature delegation, and this exists at every level, it allows you to take features and say. It's either read, read, write, or uh, read only, or not delegated. In other words, it can't be set uh, anywhere uh, below that level. And so this is uh, a really, um, you know, this is the way basically at every level you can say, at this level, I'm going to stop the ability to manipulate these uh, various sections. So that's exposed right through the IS console. It's basically the attributes that you referred to that existed in ASP.NET 2.0. They just brought it out to the rest of the world. So as ASP.NET 2.0 developers, you know, the big message is you're now first class citizens. We're no longer a subset that happens to run on IIS. We are IIS. You know, they, they leverage a lot of the great things that we already have had for years. And so all those PHP guys and classic ASP guys are, 
absolutely loving it because now they can do, you know, transportable configuration values that they used to have to edit the metabase for. So, good question. Any other questions? Is this cool stuff that everybody can see kind of what modules and handlers and extending? Is this, is this a good direction for them to, to go? Just want to, yeah. Everybody just wants to go home. Long day. Lots of stuff. Great. Well, I appreciate you guys coming out and, and sticking around for, for this last session of the day. Hope to see you out uh, tomorrow for some for more stuff. Um, you know, colin.rockstarguys.com is my blog. Um, I'll pop it up. Feel free to, to ping me if you've got any questions. I am uh, um, somewhere along the line. I became an ASP.NET MVP. Um, so I've got, uh, I've got some hooks in to ask questions and things like that. And again, I'm always happy to answer and hear what you guys are doing out there. Um, you know, this stuff is really kind of cool, and uh, it's really starting to hit the market now. A lot of the major hosting companies, have, uh, the smaller ones have added support. The larger managed hosting companies are within about three months of fully supporting IS in full production environments, IS7. And this is one of those driving forces. If you listen to the, the market research on Windows Server 2008, the reason people are going to Windows Server 2008, it all has to do with IS7. All the other features are great. But IS7 is the big thing that's pushing a lot of people to, to Windows Server 2008. So it's really kind of critical to get in now. Um, you know, there's a lot of stuff that you can do to, uh, um, you know, kind of maintain both worlds in IS6 and 7. But I think it's, it's a fairly exciting world and presents a bunch of new opportunity that would have been just really painful to, to do under IS6. So I hope you're excited. I hope you can find uh, some application in this. I mean, go out and build some modules. I'm looking forward to seeing some of them posted on IS.NET. You can publish your modules that you, uh, that you build for others to use and see. And, uh, and uh, who knows, find a, a new opportunity, a, a gap to fill, and become the next Port 80 software or one of the other kind of really cool component vendors for IS. Thanks a lot, folks. <laughs>